Hello, beautiful. This is my first Let's Clay, uh, inspired by Grim Fandango Remastered, which I've been playing through. And there will be more Let's Plays coming up uh, next week. I'm still kind of settling into my um, my recording schedule, so um, pardon me while that that's a little uh, unstable at the moment. Anyway, here I'm just showing some of the um, clays that I'm going to be using. And uh, so this is the 18 karat gold, which I'll use for those topmost flames. For these middle flames, I chose this clay, which is the copper. And these are all um, Sculpey brand Primo. Um, I like it the best for it's firm enough to hold good texture, but it's soft enough that it doesn't kill my hands. Um, for that third row of flames, I chose just gold. And then for these long ones on the sides, I thought it would be uh, a nice pop of color and something a little different. Um, I'm going to try the red glitter, which I had never worked with before. This is a brand new package. I actually run into some problems with it later. Foreshadowing. So here I'm just looking at my um, concept sketch and considering uh, how I want to construct it. Um, I'm looking at the curve of this longest, um, you know, the ones in the back that I could use those as the base. So that's what I decided to do and then, um, you know, be able to stack everything else on top of it. So I'm just starting off with some of the 18 karat gold. And I'm going to condition it. And then instead of trying to make those two separate flames at the top, I'm just going to do a really big kind of pointed egg shape. And then uh, later I'll cut that in half and create the two. So what I'm doing right now is I'm just laying out the key to make sure I have enough room for the, the beaver skull and that I like the, uh, the dimensions of it. Here I'm just lightly scoring. Now I didn't cut all the way through. Don't cut on your silicone pad if you have one of these. Like a, like a duck or something. So this first one, um, I noticed uh, when I was looking back through one of my old videos that I think the image on the the gate to the dam uh, is is actually the same as the creepy sign that Glottis is scared of. Um, when I was looking at it again, the outline from the back looks like it is in fact the the little beaver skull with the bone and then the flames and the key is hanging down in the middle of the flames. So that's why I decided to add the key to this as well. Um, and then the colors, I really just chose um, colors that I thought would be good um, matches to the uh, the aesthetic. So I went with kind of the, the colors of um, El Marro where we just left, you know, the building was gold and there was a lot of um, gold and red and also obviously fire um, for the, the demon beaver. Um, but the, the tones of it, I, I decided to you know, focus in more on like golds and coppers. So I'm just testing to see how it lays out and then I'm going back to my concept sketch. I do this a lot, I'll just go back to the sketch and it. Once I've sketched out how I want it to work, um, it really helps me plan the rest of the piece. So now I'm looking at how these next ones lay in uh, relation to that initial shape that I've created. And I can see where I want it to sit, sort of with the bottom of the key, so I know where I want that tip to be. And again, just conditioning and separating out the clay. I usually... Um, as you'll see here, I, I usually initially make uh, elements with more clay than I need because it's easier to um, cut clay away than it is to add more without a seam, particularly these um, these ones all have kind of a sheen in them. I think they've got maybe some mica powder in them or something. I'm not sure. Um, all I know is uh, adding extra pieces, you tend to end up with a visible seam 
um, unless you really spend a long time blending, but then you can really deform what you originally created. So right now I'm just uh, scoring along the line of um, the face a little bit, just kind of cutting away some of the excess to start off. And again, um, don't cut on your board. I'm, it's a bad habit of mine. This, uh, the silicone mat is new to me. I, I treated myself to it for these videos. And so I have a lot of uh, old habits from working on uh, parchment paper or just straight on, on my lap board, which you can see in the background there. I found this fabulous lap board with monsters on it going roar. All right, so now I'm looking at these next ones and I want it to look dimensional without gaining too much thickness and height. So what I'm gonna do is actually cut away from the flames directly above it. So these ones, I'm looking at the angle there and I see that it kind of mirrors that upper angle. So I'm just tracing that angle again a little bit lower and I'm gonna take those pieces off. off this little tool that I have. Um, this is a, a tool that I got from Christy Friesen, um, who you can find at cforiginals.com. Um, she is a polymer clay sculptor. Um, I, I own several, if not maybe all, of her books um, and several of her tools. Not all yet. I'm still, I'm still collecting, but this is one of my favorites. It has, you know, two different sides. One of them has a nice smoothed back, but the other one has that really nice, um, sharp edge that I can use to cut in details and things and also to point at things like look look at all these little so I'm, I'm looking again at where these ones are gonna go and planning out okay so if it comes out like that and then I just like to sketch onto the the base where I'm aiming for it makes it easier to uh, just measure measure once here visually and then fill the clay to that cutting in the face a little bit more clearly now that I've got a little bit more of it to work from. I can really see um, more clearly where I want it's It's, <laughs> unfortunately you can't, but uh, in person I was able to and I think, I, yeah, there, see, I, I knew. I knew you weren't gonna be able to see it. So I'm just lifting it up to show you a little bit more closely. I've cut in a little bit for the face there. gold this time again into two little balls and poof the magic of video editing <laughs> oh if only crafting were like that in real life and then I just set it down and score um, where I want to cut it we'll just go ahead and say that I didn't cut on my board that time we'll, we'll go ahead and say that and again, trimming off the little, the little bits, getting ready for that next one. You can see now I'm, now I'm uh, really cooking at these. Once I get the first couple down and, and figure out a few little tricks on how to, uh, how to get each piece in, each step comes a little bit more quickly. So I'm ready to move on to these long ones. This is the challenge because these have to be a little bit longer, but pretty narrow down at the bottom. And this red glitter, uh, the red glitter clay, I was able to get into these shapes with a great deal of effort. I cut out a lot of time that I spent because clay actually didn't condition super easily. Um, so if you're not uh, super familiar with polymer clay, you might not go with the red glitter. You might find it really frustrating. I had to recondition it a couple of times. I even um, ended up mixing some of my liquid clay in with it just to keep it from cracking so much. So I think, I don't know, maybe the glitter just really pulls a lot, because I noticed that about the white glitter too. I did some with white glitter recently and noticed that the clay was very dry. So I don't know, maybe the glitter absorbs some of the, the polymer moisture. So in we come with the liquid clay, liquid clay to save the day. And this is 
partially because the piece is so long, I would probably put a little bit of liquid clay under such a long element anyway, but especially because the clay was so dry and it wasn't going to adhere to the, the base on its own, um, I really wanted to make sure that that was going to stay down. All right, so I'm getting ready to start on the face. And uh, in between the red and this white, I um, I used a, a little... Um, hand wipe on off camera um, which I recommend you do if you're using especially reds seem to really saturate out of the clay and onto my hands anyway um, which means then they transfer onto the next color and for some reason I just always seem to want to work with red right before I work with white um, so I'm setting it down because those tips are actually getting in my way so I decided to go ahead and set the, the little beaver skull down mark those and then I'm going to lift it and cut those pieces away after I kind of add those marks a little strong, a little more strongly. And voila! So now I can start to set that in. I didn't quite like the, the length and the thickness of the teeth, so go ahead and mess with that for a while longer until I really am happy with it. Which looks like about like that. And it's really starting to come together. This is this is about when I really started to feel like it was looking like what I was seeing in my head. All right, looks like we're ready to do the bone. Oh, first the uh, first the beaver teeth, yeah. So you can see there, I fast forwarded through it a bit, but that that um, gap in the teeth is one of the things I love that tool for. Um, those sorts of creases. You can really, really get in there. All right, so uh, using the same um, pearlescent white. I think bones are really fun to make because they're they're really kind of easy. As you can see, you just uh, sort of roll out from the center and those knobby ends kind of form themselves. And then again, I just use that crease tool at first to give it that nice little cleft, really kind of cartoony sort of bone with the, uh, the two heads of the femur on both sides, which, yeah. Tidy it up a little bit. And this is this is definitely fast forwarded. Um, I uh, I fiddle and futz a lot. Um, as you can see, I even I even trimmed a little bit of it out. I kind of pulled it out of frame occasionally if I felt like I was really gonna sit and mess with it for a while. Um, but I feel like it really pays off at the end because I just turn it over and over and I'm looking at it and I'm always just looking for one more little thing to tweak like, oh, what if that was just a little bit, just a little bit deeper, if those were just a little bit rounder. And then, doink, right onto it. And then I just kind of lifted them up to give it, again, just a little bit more um, look of dimension. So I tucked those up onto the, the red flames a little bit to make it look like it's in front of it more. And it also makes the bone look more dimensional. All right, time for the ears and then the eyes. So just two tiny little balls of uh, the same white for the ears. And here is one of my favorite little techniques for doing ears. I make a teardrop and then I kind of flatten it with the smooth end of this tool. And I kind of roll the tip in. I use this to make um, petals and uh, feathers and scales and ears. Um, I do a lot of a lot of details with this little move here. But I always like to check them, make sure that they're more or less even. Uh, I've gotten pretty good at getting the right size of clay to make them even. Obviously, if you know you pick them up and they're kind of. Uh, Kind of close, but you know, you think the distance will cover it up. You can give it a try. You can place them like I'm doing here and see if they look right. I always place them for it. Whoa, droopy ear. There we go. 
I always kind of place them lightly first and make sure that I like them. And then I took it off camera just to kind of suture them down a little bit because it's a little fiddly at first. But you just go right into that little gap and attach them down. I also um, added a little dab of liquid clay behind them um, off camera because that was easier to do. I'm still getting used to making sure that you guys can see everything. So I also, um, I apologize in advance for, uh, well, this footage isn't great, but um, there's some coming up in a moment that's uh, even even less helpful to you and I didn't even realize it because I was so focused on what I was doing. I'm used to only needing to see what I'm doing myself and not to keep it in the line of sight of a camera. So um, so I do apologize and I am working on that um, but I'm, I'm also just so excited to start practicing that. So I apologize for the bumps as we go along here and uh, I'm gonna you know just keep working on keeping an eye on that. Even in this first video, I, I think I really started to notice more and more. So you can see I'm looking at, again at my concept sketch and just figuring out, um, I noticed that I placed those X's so that the center is kind of aligned with the gap between the, the heads of the bone and the, the teeth down below. So I went for that same kind of alignment because I liked that proportion. And then I use um, a dotting tool to go in with a little bit more detail. And then um, here I have, this is a, a brush that I've loaded with some black mica powder. And here it is, here's the useful footage. Isn't it great that you can tell what I'm doing? So you can see I edited it down considerably because you really couldn't see what I was doing at all. But I essentially, I just load up the tip of the brush with the mica powder and then just really press it down in there because as you can see with some isopropyl and a Q-tip um, or a cotton bud, um, you can uh, clean the surface off and you can get all of that excess mica powder off of the top and it'll just stay down in the in the creases. Um, this is one of my new little tricks that I've figured out. In retrospect, I kind of wish that I had put some down between the teeth as well, but, um, oh well, uh, it, it really makes the eyes pop, I think. Um, so... I'm okay with it. And here I'm also just using this to do um, this neat little trick. You can also just use a cotton bud and some uh, isopropyl to clean up everything on your piece, um, rub out a few of the, the um, deeper fingerprints. Um, it just kind of smooths everything out a little bit. You just don't want to go overboard. Um, it, can, it can get a little um, slimy because it kind of, I think it kind of smooths the surface down um, and then you, know, you want to let it dry for a second. So here are my pliers. I've got the two two rings set aside um, to attach, um, to anchor into it for the necklace. And then this one, which is going to go through the key. deciding in my concept sketch the key is pointing the head of the key is pointing to the left and I decided that I do I do like that for this as well but I did try it in both directions just to see just to make sure so I'm looking at where I want that point of connection to be and I'm gonna have these two come together with the help of some extra clay and some liquid clay so that they press together um, between that gap of the ring so that it captures the ring but leaves that top bit of it free so that the key can swing from it, but the rest of the ring is captured in between the clay. So I'm just picking out a small a small ball and making a little bale in the back, just a little connector, which I've dotted on top with some of the liquid clay. And then after I decide which way I want it to be facing on my board so that I can try to do this, this is a little bit fiddly. As you can see, I'm gonna use my pliers to place it initially, and then just press it down into that back clay and then uh, kind of crimp the sides together. And I ended up, um, off camera, I ended up adding just a tiny little ball of clay down um, inside the front of that, that crease between the two top ones underneath the top of the ring, if that makes sense, um, just to seal it from sort of, uh, you know, the, the opposite side of that um, bale that I put on the back. I put another little tiny connector in the front. I'm kind of trying to point to it. 
so that really secured that in there. All right, and with that, the piece was ready to, uh... oh, first, yes, of course, I'm going to attach these. So I place them where I want my chains to extend from. And I do that um, a little bit based on the, the shape, so I kind of go for the widest point, but also for aesthetics, so there's a bit of a range along that, that outside point that I choose. Um, in this instance, I chose it to sort of look like it's coming out between those two, those two flames, and then I mark those points. And with my, um, with my blade, I just go in and poke a little slit on either side. And then with my pliers, I hold it so that the, the join um, of the ring is facing away from the tip of my pliers so that that gets embedded. Um, I just think it looks a little bit cleaner if that's if that's the part that's hidden. So um, maybe, maybe it makes it stronger, I don't know. Um, it seems like it could, potentially, although if it's being yanked hard enough to, uh, to warp the ring, it's probably in danger anyway. Um, and you can see I'm being very careful where I put my thumb, I'm, even to the point of getting liquid clay on my other finger. I'm trying so hard to focus on where I'm putting it so that I don't smoosh things. You can kind of put pressure on both of them and, and leverage them against each other, but be careful not to let them twist on you because they can push um, off of their, uh, you know, their true um, alignment there. And then you just take these little balls of clay, the same color as the background, because they're just going to mask in, oh, show us what you're doing. There you go, me from the past, you're learning. So um, I just uh, did those quickly and then off camera, I cleaned them up a little bit, but I'll show you. You can really get them nice and smooth so that really the ring is just nice and embedded in there. And so there's liquid clay in there, there's some solid clay in there, it's all bound together around the, the back of the ring so it's nice and solid. And I'm just checking this one now that it's uh, now that it's firmed up a little bit. That's good and solid too. The key can hang a little bit loose, which is really nice. And ta-da! The completed first piece. Thank you so much for watching. Tune in. There will be more more episodes of the game coming up um, in this coming week. All right. Thanks.